can just uh, start. I assume that you are seeing my screen now. Um, yeah, we see your screen. Cool. OK, so um, the topic that I was given was methods suitable for measuring the field and pros and cons of these methods. So um, the term field is quite uh, large when we're talking about research and can be everything from um, urban wind measurements to water chemistry to sports. Uh, and um, obviously, obviously with my background and uh, for the thesis, I would focus this talk around uh, sports performance. Um, and also within uh, sports, there can be quite a big difference between uh, individual sports and team sports in how, for example, how performance are determined or um, what kind of parameters that are, are of interest. So I chose chosen to restrict my topic down to uh, individual sports uh, because most individual sports uh, are measured uh, or the performance are determined in either um, length or time. So this is uh, kind of going to be then my topic today. Um, and many of the measurement system and methods that I'm going to talk about is also used in team sports and in uh, other um, topics as well, but it was just to kind of restrict uh, the talk. So before I start uh, with um, talking about different methods, I just wanted to um, point out that uh, we're usually talking about sensor technology when um, using different methods for measuring sports. Uh, and I found it, find it really important to um, just mention the technological development over the years uh, be because sensors are getting smaller and more accurate and we are able to measure things today, not possible 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and we are also starting to grasp into uh, computer science and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So when you're talking about methods and uh, technology, uh, I think it's important to start with uh, emphasizing this development and also state the date of the talk. Uh, because uh, if I had this talk 20 years ago, mo most of uh, what I'm going to present had been quite futuristic. And in uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, some of the things that I'm talking about is outdated already. So the purpose of my talk uh, or this lecture is to present methods used to measure individual sports in the field and highlight the parameters that they can measure and the pros and cons of these methods. So uh, I will try to uh, separate, separate the parameters a measurement system can measure into primary measurement and derived measurements. So the primary measurement of uh, a system um, is the parameter that the system actually are measuring. And derived measurements are parameters that we are possible to, that we can derive from this um, primary measurement. But before uh, we start talking about measurements and methods, uh, I think it's important to take a step back uh, because we're not, uh, we're not starting with the methods, we're starting with a research question. So before we start um, talking about methods, uh, I think it's important that we emphasize that the first thing we should do uh, is to uh, define our research question. Uh, so what, are you, what do you want to find out? And from this, you can try to understand um, how we can measure that. And this is uh, quite important also when we're talking about pro, pros and cons of different methods, because uh, dependent on your research question, um, something uh, coming out of a measurement system can be either a pro or a con dependent on what, uh, where you started. 
So when you have your research question, you need to understand um, which parameters that are of interest for you. So when we're talking about sport, obviously we are interested in performance. Uh, so in my case, that's time or length. And every sport uh, and uh, movement of uh, uh, a human uh, can be explained by an athlete doing some sort of motion. Uh, and together with the forces acting on the athlete, uh, a velocity is created. And from this uh, velocity, uh, a change in position. And uh, from this, we could then um, determine the performance. So um, it's important to understand how uh, different parameters are related to each other. For example, the relationship between force, velocity, uh, and position to understand um, also how uh, a me me measurement system uh, works. And obviously also we have a lot of um, parameters related to physiology, um, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today. I'm uh, just uh, showing some examples to how we also can measure uh, physiolo uh, physiology parameters out in the field. Um, and the uh, example to the left here is also a good, uh, good example of uh, a technological development over the years. So my parameters of interest in this talk is going to be uh, the performance cascade, starting with athlete motion and down to performance. So typical parameters uh, of interest in these boxes can be obviously then length and time for performance that's uh, defined from uh, the topic. Um, we can be interested in some sort of movement or technique in a, in a, a different sports. Um, ground reaction force or aerodynamic forces are also often of interest. Um, velocity components uh, or the or some sort of trajectory analysis or turn uh, analysis in alpine skiing, for example. It can be more, um, but these are typical for um, for um, uh, sport performance research. So when we know which parameters that are of interest for us, we need to obviously then evaluate the methods and find pros and cons. Uh, and the first thing um, that we need to discuss or have uh, knowledge about is the term validity. So the validity is the degree to which a method can measure the intended purpose. And we separate this into external and internal validity. So the external validity is the extent to which the result can be generalized. So in sport, that will be how close are you to a competition setting? Uh, and the eternal validity is the degree to which the confidence is intended uh, measure is accurate and not influenced by other variables or surroundings. So that will typ typ typically be uh, in a lab when you have control over the environment and stuff like that. So we're talking about field measurements here. So then obviously the external validity is uh, of uh, important as when you are out in the field, the internal validity is naturally compromised. You want also to increase the internal validity as much as possible by having a measurement system that can measure the intended purpose accurately. Um, but if you look at the different ways to do uh, measurements in sport, you can analyze something in a competition. Uh, you can use variable sensors and um, analyze, uh, for example, a training session. You can measure in a lab, or um, you can uh, do some sort of simulations. In aerodynamics, that's uh, what we call the CFD, computational fluid dynamics, for example. And in terms of validity, uh, you have the highest, ex highest external validity if you can measure something in a competition. Uh, and the internal validity is increasing uh, when you are closer to a lab setting. And I put simulations on the side here because uh, it's uh, a bit of a debate as well. If you are getting 
uh, higher internal validity by um, si simulating something because in a way you're not uh, measuring anything. So uh, this talk is um, focusing about field measurements. I will not uh, discuss that further. Uh, so we are now talking about a um, measurement system that we can use in a competition or variable sensors that we can use uh, uh, in training. So uh, other, uh, other parameters um, that uh, we should consider when we're choosing a method is obviously first and foremost safety. So is your system safe for the athlete to use? In many sports, that's not a problem, but uh, for me working with ski jumping and also with alpine skiing, this can be really important. And it should always be considered as the first thing you think about. Um, accuracy of your measure measurement system, and that's then linked to trying to increase the internal validity, the external validity. Uh, how large uh, of a measurement volume can you have with your system? Can you measure over three meters or can you measure during the whole uh, competition? And um, how much time and how much effort uh, does your uh, measurement system take? So that's what I'm going to um, evaluate the different measurement system on. So you, ha you have then four, uh, four steps, uh, starting by uh, defining your uh, research question, uh, understanding which parameters that are of interest to you, evaluating uh, different methods, uh, and this will get you out the method of your, your choice. So I then today is going to talk about number two and number three, leave the research question up to you and uh, what you will decide as uh, your um, method of choice is also up to you. So I will start by briefly explaining how the different methods are used in field for field measurements in sport. Uh, explaining then the parameters possible to measure and derive and evaluating pros and cons. And I will try to uh, separate then the pros into green boxes and um, cons in reds. And we also have some uh, in-between factors. They may be a pro, they can be a con, dependent on what you're going to do. So, um, or just the uh, factors that you should uh, think about when you um, um, want to use certain systems. So I'm going to present then um, IMUs and uh, camera measurements, uh, force plate, pressure insoles, and something called field PIV, uh, photo cells, uh, and uh, GPS systems. Uh, and also showing how uh, some system can combine different, um, um, can both measure, for example, athlete motion and also position at the same time. Obviously, we can also measure performance uh, by some timing system or laser me measurements, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So <clears throat> we start at the top of the performance cascade with the athlete motion. So the first thing, um, I'm going to address is then uh, the IMUs. So an IMU is an inertial measurement unit sensor, and it's a combination of an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and often also a magnetometer. So together, uh, these sensors can measure uh, orientation and acceleration of the unit. They are uh, small and lightweight, um, and they are widely used in sport research to analyze movement. Um, and they are also, for example, uh, quite essentials for, essential for your um, uh, smartphones. Um, so we are able to use these uh, measurement system everywhere. So indoor, outdoor, and uh, even underwater. Uh, in, in sport, they are typically used for cyclic, uh, cyclic movement, uh, technique analysis, uh, symmetry detection, uh, and uh, injury prevention. Um, and by combining more than one IMU, um, we can also kind of uh, get 
uh, a center of mass construction and uh, look at different body segments. So for example, uh, here from uh, an article from uh, Chardonnay, he used seven IMUs, uh, two on the skis, two on the legs, uh, two on the thighs and one at the back to uh, construct a uh, central mass uh, to analyze uh, ski jumping movement. Uh, so the primary measurement of these uh, systems is then acceleration and orientation. So what uh, the, how the relationship is looking here is that we usually can uh, get something out of uh, uh, from the athlete motion or from um, the forces acting on the athlete uh, or both together. And we are relating this to performance. Uh, what kind of motion you can get out then depends on obviously how many sensors you're using and stuff like that. Um, but this is the primary um, how they are used in, um, in sports. Um, and from uh, the force, force measurement, you can also then derive uh, velocity and position. So in theory, you can get out everything you need from these sensors. Um, however, um, when you're integrating uh, from force to velocity and to position, you will get some uh, sort of integration drift. So the measurement of velocity and position from uh, one IMU uh, are often not that accurate. So this is kind of the uh, picture of how this is looking and um, how it's usually used. So from the uh, same example with the um, article from Chardonnay, um, he is here able to estimate the total aerodynamic force uh, during the, um, the, the flight phase of ski jumping. But since he uh, doesn't have any good measurement of position, uh, he cannot separate uh, the drag force from the lift force because the drag and the lift force are dependent on the direction of motion. So even if you have the total force, uh, you're not able to separate uh, the two forces from each other. So <clears throat> uh, obviously these sensors are, uh, since they are uh, small, they can be quite safe. Uh, they are used also in uh, many uh, competition settings. Um, they are really accurate uh, in terms of um, measuring acceleration and orientation, but um, obviously not that accurate uh, measuring velocity and position. Uh, you can use them everywhere, um, and then uh, they have a high external validity. I'm going to do this for all of the um, measurement system that you put on the body. That safety also is something that you always have to consider, um, just to be sure. Uh, and um, if you do like Chardonnay with seven IMUs, that's not uh, in the ski jumping. That's not nothing that you can use in a competition. So usually the external validity is high, but maybe not always. Um, they can be quite time consuming because uh, you need a sport specific post processing. So if you want to uh, do some analysis in uh, speed skating and you don't haven't used uh, these kind of sensors before, uh, it will take time to set up. Um, and uh, you need also to calibrate the uh, sensors on the athlete. So the biggest um, Calm then is uh, that uh, you're not getting um, good data out from the velocity and uh, positions from the sensors. Uh, and you often need more than one sensor to get out a complete pic uh, picture also of the athlete motion. <coughs> Sorry. So over to force measurements. So we have a few uh, different um, ways to measure force, um, but the most um, widely used is uh, force plates. So they uh, are highly precise uh, force measurement and are mostly used in, in labs. So for example, I think the most uh, famous one is the Kistler force plate. Um, 
and then you can measure force in three direction um, and in field. They can be used, for example, between uh, the track or the snow or the ice. Um, and uh, for example, in skiing then between the ski and the binding or beneath the snow. Um, so for example, in um, uh, both in cross country skiing and in ski jumping, they have uh, force plates um, uh, beneath the snow. And um, they have also used, um, for example, uh, here from um, uh, Oftonen, um, force plates between the, um, the ski and the binding in uh, cross country skiing, and it's also used in alpine skiing and in uh, ski jumping. Um, pressure insoles. So um, these pressure insoles are quite lightweight, um, and they can measure then the pressure distribution on the foot um, and force or uh, pressure, but, but not the direction of the force. So they are widely used in uh, sport research. So um, we have uh, typical an analysis from alpine skiing, cross country, uh, running, uh, speed skating, and uh, also in ski jumping. Uh, and also you widely used in uh, injury prevention. So I wanted to take these two, both the force plate and pressure insoles together to kind of get the whole picture. Um, and when we look at the same uh, cascade, these types of um, sensors can usually get out this picture. So you can measure the force or some sort of force, uh, but not related to the motion or to velocity or position. So if you're interested in the force, uh, it could be really good. But if you need to derive other measurement systems, uh, other measurements from the system, then uh, they're not maybe the, the best choice. So uh, if you look at the pros and cons, starting with the force plate beneath the uh, track, snow and ice, um, they are obviously quite safe or really safe because they're not, um, um, you're not uh, measuring or doing anything with the athletes. Uh, so you can also use it in uh, competition uh, if you have one installed. Um, but uh, the accuracy is not uh, not that good. Uh, in uh, as um, for example, um, my one of my opponent was uh, Vilma Virta, and uh, he's been doing this in uh, in um, ski jumping. Uh, and then you have a block of ice upon the force plate, and the ice block has to be mounted to. Um, the rest of the, the hill. So it's uh, the accuracy could be uh, not that good. But the accuracy of the force plate in itself are really good. Uh, if you have to set it up yourself, it could be quite, uh, take some time um, and be quite expensive as well. And the volume then will be as large as your force plate. So maybe a few meters or something like that. Um, the volume is uh, really high for force plates that we can mount on uh, the ski, so between the ski and binding. Um, but again, you have to consider uh, how good your accuracy is going to be. It's uh, going to depend a bit on uh, the shoe as well. For example, the difference in stiffness between an alpine skiing boot, which is also mounted both at the front and the back, uh, compared to a cross-country skiing. Uh, boot, which is not that stiff and only mounted at the front. Uh, it will take a lot of time to set up and you would need some other measurement system to get out the direction of the ski. Um, and maybe the biggest con is the, um, the safety, because uh, when you're mounting um, force plate between the ski and the binding in, for example, ski jumping and alpine skiing, this can be quite dangerous. And we had some um, um, crashes actually in uh, Norway uh, in uh, ski jumping. So this has to be considered and it's not uh, something that you would use in the competition. Um, the pressure insoles um, are more safe and you can get out a large volume. 
but once again, you struggle with uh, uh, accuracy um, and they are not used in uh, competition settings. Um, and you, you don't have uh, any sense of the direction of the force or the pressure. Um, and you obviously also need an insole that fits the, um, the athlete's uh, shoe. So um, this is kind of the primary measurements of force, but I, I wanted to have something uh, shiny and uh, cool in my presentation. So I included something called in-field PIV. So PIV is uh, particle image velocimetry, and that's usually used uh, inside a wind tunnel. So it's an optical measurement technique where you can measure the velocity field around an object. Um, and it's measured by um, having uh, particles inside the wind tunnel um, and you're taking pictures and tracking every particle uh, in the flow from one time step to another. So from this, you can get out uh, drag measurements uh, by the changes in air velocity. So this is obviously uh, something um, that they do inside a lab, but there's a group in Delft in, uh, I don't know if, if I'm saying it right, but uh, I think it's uh, Delft in the Netherlands, uh, which have uh, basically just taken the lab out in the field. So they, uh, they have started using this for drag analysis in both cycling and in speed skating. So uh, instead of you doing this in a wind tunnel, they have um, exerted soap, uh, soap bubbles with helium and uh, have them inside the tent here. So it's looking like, uh, like this. So it's a really, uh, really cool uh, way to just take the lab uh, out uh, to the field and do field measurements. Uh, so I will see. Uh, yeah, so you can see here how they can track every particle in the flow. And uh, from this, you can also get out, um, for example, drag, uh, drag measurements. So obviously, this is uh, quite safe. Uh, and from uh, the articles that they have published, it seemed to be uh, really accurate. Um, but uh, the safety is also here uh, dependent on the sport, because I would not try this in ski jumping, for example. It would be really dangerous. Um, I think you would struggle also for using this uh, in a competition. Um, and the volume. Uh, of this uh, system is really small. Uh, and I guess that it's going to take a lot of time to set up and that it's uh, really expensive. So, but it's a really cool, uh, cool way to, uh, to uh, use a typical lab uh, measurement system out in the field. So when we're talking about then, uh, the next on, the, on my list there, uh, that's uh, velocity measurements. And that's a bit, uh, I will say it's a bit different from the rest because um, you're not measuring velocity directly with most system. You're measuring something else. Uh, and then you're cal calculating your way to velocity. Um, but um, I have uh, two examples where velocity is kind of the primary measurements, uh, even uh, if you're measuring something else, and that's photocells. So photocells is a really accurate measurement of time between two points. So it's not measuring velocity, but you're measuring time, but it's used, um, for example, as a standard in every ski jumping hill for um, measuring velocity. Um, so um, obviously they're also really safe. And they are accurate measurement of time. So if you have set it up correctly, it's going to be accurate. Uh, the external validity is uh, high. It's used in uh, many sorts of competition. And it's really easy to use. It's something used by most coaches as well. Uh, you need to set it up accurately. And uh, yeah, the volume is uh, not uh, that big. Uh, if you're, uh, for example, interested in velocity and you're not getting out anything more 
than velocity or the time then from these measurements. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I didn't include in my uh, PhD because I didn't think that I had the time was uh, a pitot tube. Um, so a pitot tube is uh, also something that we um, mostly used uh, use in uh, a lab. So uh, a pitot tube is measuring the pressure difference uh, from the stagnation um, pressure and the static pressure in the flow. So in an airflow, um, the velocity and pressure of the airflow is uh, re uh, highly related. So by measuring the uh, pressure at the, the um, tip of the tube, where uh, you have uh, zero um, um, velocity, and uh, measuring the pressure um, in the static, uh, static pressure in the airflow, you can calculate your way to the air velocity. So it's a highly accurate measurement uh, for um, flow velocity. And it's used, for example, also on airplanes. Uh, and this is mostly used inside wind tunnels and in labs. But uh, we see them in uh, Formula One, for example. And uh, so uh, they can measure the air flow of the car or they can be used in uh, aerodynamic testing, like the picture to the right there, where they have uh, what they call a pitot rake with a lot of different, um, with a lot of uh, pitot tubes measuring the airflow at uh, uh, different points to evaluate the, um, uh, our aerodynamic behavior of the car. So uh, in Formula One, they are quite safe, really accurate, and you can measure through the, uh, whole competition, but it's um, more or less restricted to uh, sports like Formula One. This is nothing that you can use in uh, alpine skiing or in uh, speed skating in the same way. Uh, and they are really expensive. It would take a lot of time. Um, so and uh, so as a field, the measurement system is quite restricted, but uh, it's uh, interesting to see something uh, a bit unexpected in a presentation as well. So what uh, these measurement system can do is uh, then uh, measuring velocity from some sort of other uh, measurements. So time with the photocells or pressure difference with the pitot tube. And you can relate it to performance. So at the end then at the position measurements, um, then the most obvious one is uh, GPS and before we talking about GPS, I just wanted to um, talk about the difference between a GPS, a GNSS, and a DGNSS. Um, so, because what we use in research is GNSS or DGNSS, but we're saying GPS. So GPS is kind of the common term. So GPS is standing for the Global Positioning System. Um, and the GPS system is the American satellite system. So from this, uh, you can use then the American satellites to calculate your position. A G, uh, GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. So um, in addition to the American satellite system, you also have, for example, Galileo, which is the European satellite system, and GLONASS, which is the Russian one. So you're getting in more uh, satellites. So your measurements uh, is uh, going to get um, even more accurate. And for example, with a lot of the um, watches today, uh, like Polar and Garmin, um, they have a GNSS uh, uh, in the watch, but uh, usually they uh, call it GPS just to uh, not confuse people. Uh, a DGNSS, it's what uh, some of the, my articles in my PhD is based on. Uh, then you have the, um, uh, a GNSS with the differential solution. So you have the same setup as in a GNSS, but in addition, close to uh, your um, measurements, is, uh, measurements, so it close to the, for example, the track in alpine skiing or the ski jumping hill, you have a base station uh, and you know that this base station is uh, static for the whole test. Um, 
So by calculating both the position uh, on the athlete and a static position close to um, your um, hill, you can uh, even you can get out um, an accuracy here around uh, a decimeter or something like that. And uh, here you are at around five centimeters. So you are increasing your accuracy of the system. And the same picture is only used here, uh, not to confuse you, but uh, uh, usually a GNSS system can also be much smaller um, than the DNSS systems. So, and uh, what you get by uh, using a DGNSS is that the accuracy is getting up. <coughs> so, uh, these are then restricted to outdoor measurements because you need to be able to talk to the satellites. Um, and you can also then derive the um, position velocity force relationship uh, if you have the DGNSS. And they are the DGNSS is typically used uh, to uh, estimate the acting forces, uh, velocity, and trajectory. It's mostly used in alpine skiing, and we have been starting using it in ski jumping as well. Uh, GNSS systems are more widely used for time anal analysis, uh, speed, and distance, uh, and they are often combined together with an IMU, uh, which I'm going to um, uh, present after this. So uh, with these sort of systems, you're starting at the position and you can obviously uh, get to performance from that or related to performance. Uh, you can derive velocity uh, and you can also derive uh, the acting forces on the athlete if you have a DGNSS system. So this is the um, um, picture on how it will uh, look, what you can get out of these uh, sort of systems. Um, and uh, the accuracy of the DG, uh, DGNSS are uh, really high, um, and uh, the external validity of the GNSS is really high. So a GNSS can uh, typically be used in a competition. Um, and when you have kind of your setup, you don't need any external calibration time on the athlete, for example. Again, the safety has to be considered uh, use, if you want to use it uh, in uh, high risk sports, but uh, we have used it both in um, speed, um, ski jumping and alpine skiing, but it's not uh, something that you would use in a competition. Uh, the volume is then restricted to outdoors um, and the DGNSS can be quite complex to use. Um, and the external validity is um, not that high because you need to have a backpack on the athlete and you have to have the antenna mounted on the head of the athlete and they are also quite expensive. <clears throat> Another type of uh, positioning system is the LPS, so that's a local positioning system uh, and instead of uh, satellites you then use local transmitters uh, so you can use them for example indoor as well. And this is uh, one example uh, where this is used is in every ski jumping co uh, competition. They use uh, LPS system to um, uh, broadcast the, the speed uh, during the flight, for example, um, through ultra wideband radio tracking. <coughs> and um, we also have uh, sensors where you can combine for example, an EMU and a GNSS. You have a lot of different types of these sensors. I'm just going to show one example. Uh, and that's uh, the Optimi S5 catapult, where you have a GNSS and a, an IMU in the same unit. So then you can get out um, uh, position and velocity, and also some sort of technique detection from uh, the IMU. So this is an example from cross-country skiing where they use then the GNSS to measure both time and velocity and get out the, the track or the course. And then they use the IMU to detect different, um, different sub-techniques of, um, uh, of the cross-country skiers. So with uh, such a system, you can get out uh, both then uh, position and velocity from the GNSS and some sort of knowledge from the athlete motion 
uh, through the IMU. Um, also quite safe to use. The example I showed was from uh, a ski jumping uh, competition. So the external validity also is high uh, and you can measure through the whole competition. Um, to get out the complete athlete motion, you would need more than one IMU. <coughs> uh, and you will struggle with ac accuracy good enough to get out uh, the picture with the uh, force as well. Some of the um, acceleration can uh, maybe be used to derive some of the forces from the IMU, but uh, this is usually how it's um, used uh, today. So the last thing I'm going to talk about then is uh, camera measurements. <coughs> so um, camera uh, cameras and video analysis is usually is a commonly used uh, by coaches for qualitative analysis of every sport performance. If you want to do it in research, um, you could uh, manually annotating uh, pictures of uh, the athlete and uh, try to analyze uh, the movement through, uh, through the picture. Um, and if you have a stationary camera, you can also derive uh, the position and then position al analysis if you have high enough uh, resolution and sample rate of the camera. <coughs> uh, and if you increase the number of cameras, you can increase the accuracy or the volume that you can measure over. But uh, by doing this manually, the biggest, um, the biggest con is time, because it takes a lot of time to manually annotate pictures. So what we did also started in my PhD was uh, to try to solve the time uh, problem by using uh, machine learning. So we uh, trained up um, a machine learning program to recognize a ski jumper. So uh, we trained it on uh, around 10,000 pictures of uh, ski jumpers. Uh, so you can get out um, something like this. So this is manually annotated by uh, our program. Um, so then you don't need for every, every time you're out in the field to, uh, to do this uh, annotation by yourself. <clears throat> And this is obviously an example where it worked really well. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of um, struggles with it as well. Uh, and um, from uh, such a measurement system, if it's working, you can then get out the athlete motion from, um, from the 3D, um, yeah, from, from the system. And uh, also both the uh, uh, central mass position, velocity, and force. So in theory, you can get out the whole picture from athlete motion down to performance. But there's a few things that you need to be aware of. Um, and we question this with um, art artificial intelligence. How, how smart are these uh, programs, actually? Uh, so this program is, re is uh, trained to recognize a ski jumper. <clears throat> So it will recognize a ski jumper almost every time. But if you try to do something else, uh, you will get out nothing. So it would not work. So the program is telling me that uh, this is not a ski jumper. So if we want to use it for alpine, ski alpine skiing, we have to start all over again. And um, the other thing that you need to be aware of is uh, picture interference. So this was from uh, one of my uh, data collections from my PhD. We set up the camera and start measuring. We were supposed to be there for three days. And uh, two hours uh, after we started, it looked like this. And it was looking like this for two days. Uh, and then the um, camera measurement will struggle. So luckily, we also had the DGNSS and got out uh, measurements from that. And, um, we were doing uh, also a measurement in the Holman column. I was going there for the uh, World Cup competition. So I was there under the Norwegian championship to kind of see and understand how it's uh, going to work with my camera setup and lightning and everything like that. 
So we trained it also on this condition. And when I come to, to the World Cup, it looked like this. So it was a completely different uh, setting. Um, and even uh, if it, it, tried, it was actually okay, uh, this setting, but uh, we also struggled with uh, stuff like this. So I lost almost 50 jumps or something like that because people were standing in the way and I had to chase, chase them off. So you can get out then, in theory, the whole um, cascade from athlete motion and down to performance. Uh, it's really safe and the external validity is high because you're not influencing the athlete. Um, with uh, some sort of uh, po post estimation uh, system or machine learning, you can also, it can take uh, quite short time. Um, and uh, you just have to understand that uh, the accuracy is not going to be better than the eye that trained your system. Uh, and uh, which uh, the, the cameras and the camera setting that you have and also the surroundings. So the lighting for it, lightning, for example, is really important. Uh, the volume is quite restricted to whatever, um, how large you, know, you can uh, film at one time. And it's really time consuming without the post estimation system. Uh, and obviously uh, picture interference can be uh, a problem as well. So then we are starting to come to the end. So just as a summary, uh, we start obviously with the, our research question and uh, I'll leave that uh, up to you guys. Uh, we understand which parameters that are of interest for us. And from these parameters, we can uh, find methods that uh, both can uh, use, uh, measure these parameters with the primary and derived measurements. And then we evaluate uh, dependent on uh, stuff like safety, accuracy, validity, and maybe also use some sort of sensor fusion. And this is getting our methods. So with pictures, start with uh, your uh, sport of interest, find your research question, define your parameters of interest, uh, evaluate the different methods available, um, and then uh, find the pros and cons, which will get out your method of choice. Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Ulla, for this very well-structured uh, lecture on, uh, on the different methods we can use in uh, human movement uh, sciences and in in, uh, in sports specific, um, are there any any questions from the uh, from the audience or, or comments from the audience? People that want to uh, just open your microphone and start talking, or raise your hand and. I have a short question. My name is Hein Dane. I wonder, you did all the camera analysis without pre-marking. Would it help if you pre-mark the body on certain locations like the joints? Would that make it much easier to process the data? What's your uh, opinion? Pre-mark, pre, pre um, like a pre-mark on, on the suits? Yeah, for instance, or on the, the point of the helmet, or we, the, I, when I looked at your images, they were not pre-marked. So the, the software has to detect the interesting points. Would it help if you pre-mark the body or are there disadvantages? Um, this system would not, uh, it would not help this system because it's not trained on the pre-marked bodies. But uh, I, I guess that if we trained it on pre-marked bodies, maybe we could get it to be more accurate. But uh, we didn't want it to uh, be um, needed to, uh, we didn't want the system to be kind of uh, dependent on pre-marked uh, positions because uh, this is going to be used also in uh, World Cup competitions. And uh, if I as a Norwegian try to uh, ask the Austrian coach or the Polish coach to pre-mark the suits on the athletes, uh, it wouldn't be... Uh, that um, popular, I think. So mm -hmm. we wanted to have a system that uh, not was dependent on uh, on uh, this, but uh, 
I guess you could get get it maybe more accurate if you, but you'd also need to train it on the pre-marked uh, stuff. Yeah. Thank you for a very comprehensive review. Thank you. Are there any other questions for uh, Ola? Oh, I, I have a question about uh, uh, how you get everything done uh, money-wise. Because uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands, at least, uh, maybe it, because we are a little bit cheap in the Netherlands, it's always difficult to get, uh, to, to get money for research. And, and if I look to the uh, Norwegian situation, uh, uh, it looks like that, uh, that, that there are possibilities there that are not available uh, somewhere else. How did your uh, research be funded? Yeah, so, so you have um, the Norwegian Olympic Committee, um, which is uh, getting a lot of money from the government. So the Norwegian Olympic Committee is kind of, you have um, all of the different sports, and then uh, the Norwegian Olympic Committee is a separate, a separate organization in a way. But uh, from that, we're helping... Um, um, you're helping uh, the sports that uh, have the highest possibility to get uh, Olympic medals. Or um, so, for example, in Norway, you have um, with the winter sports, um, ski jumping, cross country skiing, and stuff like that. So, uh, and uh, through the Norwegian Olympic Committee, um, you can um, apply for uh, research money, or uh, they are also. Kind of interested in research so i have a um, part-time position 50 percent position at the norwegian olympic committee um, and the government also they have um, this uh, sport research center so you have uh, one that is uh, up in uh, granosen which uh, is led by Evin sandbach and uh, gatja Nettema. so that's the norwegian research center for um, elite sport and I've been a part of another one, which is called uh, Sport Technologies, which is more, um, um, yeah, aerodynamics and uh, stuff like that. So um, I think you have um, a few ways to actually get uh, money for um, for research. So I had a part time position at uh, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and a part time position at uh, the. Um, uh, Olympic uh, Committee, if that so there helps. Is, there is a, a, a kind of natural uh, connection between uh, science one side and, and sports on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And the, the same is true for, for you in the technological field, but uh, I know that the uh, uh, on, on the, for instance, the physiology side, uh, there are uh, good links as well. So that is a, a model that works at least. Yeah, and we're really, really close to to the sports. So on a daily basis, I'm uh, talking to and working with uh, both the uh, ski jumpers and the alpine ski skiers, the coaches and the athletes. And they contact me if they are uh, wondering about anything. And um, so it's a really short way from the athlete uh, to the researcher in a way. Yeah, looks almost... Uh... Uh, optimal <laughs> yeah well yeah i think uh, it's around five million people in uh, norway and uh, we've been uh, ranked as one of the best sporting nations in the world with uh, a few times so that's good <laughs> <laughs> okay are there any other questions related to uh, or maybe related to uh, the content of his thesis but uh, uh, it's up to you. If you like to ask, just do it. Maybe I forget. Yeah, no, yeah. If I may, uh, Jos, yeah, because yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, congratulations with your uh, PhD. It's since it's uh, uh, pretty recently that you uh, you obtained it. Um, it's a clear overview, so that makes, but it also makes asking a relevant question a bit difficult because I was. Um, uh, curious about uh, you work with the video uh, you said that to, uh, to uh, can you give the example what the maybe that's too asking too much or but the coaches 
what the specific question of the coach was and what you with your video analysis uh, during the flight uh, of the ski jump. Uh, I think that was one of your uh, your latest uh, articles. Uh, what if that you could contribute to uh, asking, uh, not not ask answering that question. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Um, well, um, we were quite close with the coaches, so they have obviously um, questions about the technique and the technical differences uh, between athletes and stuff like that. Um, and um, the, for example, and I, I have never been uh, a ski jumper myself, so I kind of look at it from outside, and uh, I'm not influenced by uh, kind of the um, norms of the sport, and I think that's quite important as well. Um, so, for example, in the in the last uh, article. What I looked at and what we found out was uh, that there's a quite big difference uh, in uh, which um, parameters that are relates to performance in the different ski jumping hill sizes. So in, for example, an Olympic competition, you have two different sizes of the hills and how um, which parameters that are important for a good performance in the two different hill sizes uh, change. So, and this is something then, so I'm, I'm taking it directly to the coaches. And it was, uh, this was a good example of something that they haven't uh, thought about it in that way. Um, but when you're talking about it, and then it made sense for them as well. Uh, and then they also, it started a discussion between them because then they started to find that, okay, yeah, this and this uh, ski jumpers, they are usually good in the small hills. And uh, so, um, but that's that was actually more on the GPS or the DN, uh, GNSS part because uh, um, I started my uh, thesis uh, in uh, November 2019. So I think I had like three months without COVID. Uh, and in that time, we got uh, only the one. Uh, um, it was, uh, the, the intention was to have not like 90% camera measurements, but uh, we didn't get any uh, <laughs> any data during okay. the COVID uh, period. And so, 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 so then you had three months and then you had uh, lots of clouds also. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't help. Okay, thanks. But I think it's a good, uh, good way where uh, we, uh, uh, how we work, that we, we sit down with the coaches and, discuss with them okay this is my findings uh, and uh, how how does this um, how does this uh, look in your picture or in, in your world as a coach and they they see different things than I do and uh, we usually also do this kind of discussions before we publish uh, just because they all, uh, can have uh, some other point of views that could be really helpful also for uh, a publication. Yeah, sure. Okay. And yeah. another good example of uh, questions to all of our, for instance, from the Norwegian speed skating coaches, they just wanted to beat the Dutch at the uh, team time trial of the team pursuit. And uh, Ola took them uh, into the wind tunnel uh, uh, to get more knowledge about the uh, skating behind each other and, and how to push, push each other. And they found out uh, a very good and effective uh, way to uh, actually win twice a gold medal on that uh, topic but what good is on the other side is also that they don't uh, take only the, the the knowledge to the coaches but they uh, simply also publish it because uh, here you see uh, the publication uh, based on these measurements and uh, so it's science on one side and they publish it as science and on the other side uh, just helping coaches it's just wonderful and and good to see that it is possible and that it is fundable. I think the kind of the general idea that uh, also the sports understand is that um, um, we have to, I as a researcher has to publish, uh, but what uh, is written in the article, it's just a fracture of um, the value that they get out of it. So they get so much more out of kind of the, the um, the, the tests that we do, then uh, it's even possible to 
publish. So this the kind of it's uh, quite small the the things that's coming out. So it's not that um, um, even if we publish it, it's it's not going to uh, the the value for the athletes are so much higher. So they understand that I want to help them, but I also need to publish, and um, they get more out of the out of it than um, than. Um, what's coming out in the paper. So uh, that's uh, kind of the general idea we have, uh, I think in, uh, in Norway as well, because we're not, we're, we're not afraid of publishing our, our data. Um, and I, I, think that's, I think that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ola, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And if you uh, was here in the Netherlands to do it here, I would give you a good uh, a bottle of wine or, or, or beer or whatever. Um, but uh, next time I will be, uh, when I'm in, in Norway, I will bring something for you. Ah, thank you. Uh, and um, the audience, uh, thanks for uh, uh, joining us and for having uh, uh, Ula here as a presenter. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>